Hello, thank you so much to Bloomberg for hosting this amazing summit and thanks so much to my brilliant panel who we're going to be talking to in a minute about what are some are calling the holy grail of carbon disclosure. Let me just talk a little bit about uh, why this is so important. So I'm Claire O'Neill. I head up the Climate and Energy Programme at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and I'm joined today by Rebecca Marmont who is the Chief Sustainability Officer of Unilever, one of the world's biggest fast-moving consumer goods companies and one who is absolutely committed to the net zero target by 2039 or sooner. I've also got Dick and Pinner, who heads up McKinsey's global sustainability practice, and Jules uh, Koshenhurst, who is the head CEO of the Rocky Mountain Institute, a very venerable, thought-leading institution that focuses on the how of the energy transition. But you see, you saw some of those numbers pop up just now on the screen. CO2 at four and a half million year highs, impacts already starting to happen uh, well ahead of forecasts in terms of the climate. And we know now what we have to do, the scientists have told us about the importance of this net zero landing zone and the levers we have to pull. But when we developed the greenhouse gas protocol back at the World Business Council a few years ago, we came up with three buckets of emissions. Scope one, the bit that are relatively easy to measure, your company's responsible for them. Scope two, your energy purchases, again, relatively easy to track. And then this scope three emissions, emissions that run all the way up and down the business value value chain. And for some sectors like oil and gas, for example, 80% plus of their emissions are outside the company's direct control and yet hugely impactful in the decarbonisation journey. So how do you track them? How do you add all of those emissions up and aggregate them and assign responsibility for their reduction? Something we've been talking about for years, but we finally have a collaborative solution coming together. And I'm delighted uh, to, as I say, bring the panel together to talk about something we are working on together which is something we've called the Carbon Transparency Partnership. Real-time aggregation of real data into one data lake so we can actually work out what scope three emissions are and ascribe responsibility and measure it. Because, of course, if you can't measure things, you can't manage them. So thanks for tuning into this. Hugely important. Rebecca, I'm going to start with you with the question is, can you tell us why scope three emissions calculations are so important to Unilever? Well, hi, Claire. Thanks very much for, for the invitation and good afternoon, everyone. I mean, a, a lot of this conversation today is about, about data and about measurement, but obviously to, to get to that point, just, just, just to remind everyone, you know, the big challenge for us is even getting to net zero. We're completely rethinking how we source, how we manufacture, how people use our products. So portfolio shifts, focus things like plant-based, thinking about changing packaging, working on systems, infrastructure, et cetera. So really thinking, how do you come to a point where you've got absolute emissions reduction, really driving innovation and, and changing all of that. So not just about offsetting. So of course, then when you come to the measurement of that, very obviously, very complicated supply chains with multiple actors makes it very difficult just to track scope three emissions upstream and, and, and downstream. If you, if you think, for example, at Unilever, the entire life cycle of our products from the sourcing of those crops and the commodities all the way through the manufacturing process and then out into sales. And of course, as we move now and, and shift into a circular economy, there are many, many different variables at all those different points along the, along the value chain. So I think that lack of data and the business systems needed to communicate info has been really, really challenging. And I say that with, with the multiple endpoint being, we know that consumers want to better understand the carbon footprint of their products. People want to make the right kind of choices and to try and improve their purchasing. But when the data is so complicated, it, it, it's been very, very difficult. And as you know, and Claire, you've talked about it, companies typically reporting on different scopes, some one and two, some including three. So what we found is, and what we were really looking for is information and an agreed way of deciding at a product level, so what's actually bought and sold, um, the, the, the data behind that. So there's been such a, a general lack of GHG data at, at a relevant level of specificity. So this kind of project, which is going to help us to agree standards, benchmarks and enable all of us to have much greater data, I think is hugely important, A, towards enabling us to reach the target and B, in being able to communicate and offer much more transparency to our consumers. 
I, I, just to pick up on that point, Rebecca. So in theory, you could put bright, you, you could put data on your on your products on the shelf and say we can certify that the carbon footprint of this particular product is X because we've got the reliable data behind it. Is that is that the end game really for Unilever? Exactly. Well, I think it's, it's twofold. I think part of it is ensuring we ha we can reach our absolute emissions reductions target. So we, we need to know in order to be able to measure ourselves. But the consumer part is massive. I mean, Deloitte released something at the end of last year about the change and the shift in consumers. And I think nearly half of people now said they want to choose brands that have environmental and wider sustainability values attached to them. And people are making active choices already in choose, you know, choosing, for example, to eat less meat, moving to plant-based, 20% of people swapping to low carbon emissions transports and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think where we can help consumers to make much more informed purchasing decisions and empowering them to be part of that solution, it's really, really important. Plus as well, I think, when you think about the external environment, carbon taxes are coming. You know, there could be a, a, a time when we see carbon border taxes, individual countries putting that into play. You know, investors, hugely, hugely important area for them. We, we launched our own climate transition action plan at our AGM um, in May, so just a couple of months ago, really detailing how we plan to get to net zero and putting in place interim targets because 2039, it will come all of a sudden, but you know it's it's a long time away. And so actually it's important for us to be able to detail, this is our plan, this is what we're doing over the next three years. I think that helps to bring a level of confidence and again, also transparency, hugely important. important. Thank you so much. Um, Dickon, you are uh, the leading person at McKinsey focused on the sustainability agenda. McKinsey will need no introduction. You're representing or working with hundreds of companies across multiple sectors. Does this scope three challenge apply to multiple sectors and multiple supply chains? Give us your sense of how important it is to the McKinsey client base. Oh, I, I think um, it's uh, tremendously important. And thank, thanks for hosting us, Claire. And I, just building on the, the comments from Rebecca, um, you know, the, the, the hard-nosed version of this it, for every client is that, you know, it's sort of, in many cases, not your fault, but it is your problem. Um, and there, there's a hidden form of currency that's in your supply chain that has a different exchange rate in every geography and trade implications. And so what happens in every industry is if you think about a commodity cost curve, oil, steel, soybeans, Every cost curve, effectively, the pieces on that cost curve get reordered. You end up in a different spot, and the cost curve gets steeper. So if you're on the left side of that, you potentially make more profit. And if you're on the right side of that, you may not have a business. So this changes the fundamental basis of competition. It's literally like, you know, Danish krona or Deutschmarks or some other currency showed up in your, uh, up in your supply chain. So I think that's the, the, the biggest point. And, and Based on that, it will change capital allocation. So this, when it gets in the hands of CFOs, will def define where capital gets allocated. It will define how products get developed. It will ha define how suppliers get chosen. Um, so I, I think it's uh, enormously important uh, as the as the um, kind of table stakes. And then just building on what, what Rebecca said, I think you, to do that, you need common methodologies and standards, and you need incredible collaboration across, across supply chains. And that doesn't matter whether you're in a car supply chain or a consumer supply chain, food, uh, et cetera. So uh, tremendously important, I think, to all of our clients. Uh, and one of the things we found with the pathfinders, of course, many supply chains go all the way back to extractive industries. And then you end up with these multiple webs and actually involving uh, companies at all stages of the value chain is sort of crucial to getting this reliable data. But Jules, you and RMI have this very long and venerable history of really working to solve this challenge of decarbonisation, particularly of energy, in a very sort of data-driven uh, and market-based way. G give us your perception on this scope three challenge because again it's something where we're really happy to be working together on this yeah claire you know i often start my comments by reminding everyone that we're facing a planetary emergency and um, if you are facing a challenge uh, of that magnitude then you want to be measuring so that you can manage and it is really quite striking that until recently we all all of us together uh, hadn't sort of thought through how are we going to measure this 
across supply chains, not for an individual company, each on their own, but across supply chains so that comparable data is available for the consumer to make decisions, for the investor to make decisions, as Dickon uh, was, was just saying, uh, for, for procurement to make decisions on, on what to buy from their supply chains. Um, so scope three is not something nice for some bureaucrat somewhere who's come up with yet another reporting requirement. It's something critically important for managers that want to drive the effectiveness, cost effectiveness also, of their own supply chains. And if you don't get your hands around scope three emissions and, and the cost associated with those, you can't manage your business. So it is, it is in many ways for us quite striking and quite obvious that this is now a top priority. The good news is, as you were saying, uh, because people are coming together to realize, okay, we need to get this done, we need to get this done quickly, collaboration is emerging, that is really critical. Uh, Dickens' teams and our teams are working together on this. Uh, we're partnering with you guys at WBCSD. Companies are piling in left, right, and center. The accounting firms are realizing the importance of this. We're going to we're going to get this done. Uh, the critical question is: Can we get it done fast enough? Can we get this uh, sorted not over the next five years, but over the next eighteen months, um, uh, so that everybody can start to say, "Okay, I know quite." accurately what my scope one, two, and three emissions are, and therefore how I make my investment decisions to get to net zero. And, and you mentioned net zero, critically important in all of this is, yes, net zero by 2050-ish, but 50% emission reductions over the next uh, critical decade. Uh, yes. And that's putting that time pressure on it, right? That's why we have to work together. Jules, thank you for that. I mean, drawing what you, from what you're saying, so it's, what we're building essentially is a, is a carbon accounting system, it sounds like, to go alongside the cash accounting system that has for so long determined profit measures, investment signals, compensation, and we're basically building out a carbon accounting system with a degree of granularity that we haven't had before. But I think what's fascinating is that it seems to be being led by the private sector. And I, as a former politician, Jules used to spend some time in politics. We, we don't want to go too hard on bashing the policy framework. But I guess I'd like to perhaps pose a question back to you, Jules, which is it feels like in this case that the collaborative companies who really get this, like Unilever, are driving this charge. Do you think the policy framework is helping? And are there things, for example, that could assist this transition that perhaps we should be lobbying for at big moments like the G20 or COP later this year? Look, um, there are definitely pushes coming out of the policy sector that uh, lead companies like uh, Unilever and others to say, yeah, we need to focus on this. But you're right, the, the, the front runners at the moment is the private sector. And that is good because I think we'll get this done much more rapidly if it is led by, conceived by, thought through by people who actually have to put it in practice. Now. Companies like Unilever, and there are many others um, who are at the front of this, uh, will want to make sure uh, that others join as well, that it's not just the usual suspects, the companies that have always been at the leading edge. Uh, Unilever's procurement capabilities, Amazon's or Walmart's procurement muscle will help with that. Uh, but at some point, there becomes uh, there comes a really important role for policymakers to bless what we're coming up with in the mm -hmm. private sector and to say, okay, uh, now that the framework has been established by the collaboration of people around this table or, or elsewhere, uh, now we're gonna make this the mandatory way in which we do business. So it's not just a license to operate, but it's actually also standard reporting formats uh, and so on. Uh, but, but right now I'm actually quite pleased that the front runners, the leaders of all of this come from the private sector because it's, uh, it happens a little bit more snappily. It does. And, and, and let's, Rebecca, could you comment on that? Because you didn't do this because some national or global climate policy or regulator said that you had to do this. You, you essentially were one of the founders of this particular project and said, we need this in order to meet our ambitions. What, what's missing, though, is are there things that the policymakers could be doing that could make this go smoother or faster? 
So I think I think there's a couple of things. I mean, you're right, Claire. We we did it, and I talked a bit in in the first question about the importance for us in giving consumers transparency. We talked a little bit about investors. Of, of course, there's a role for government as well. I mean, one of the things that we learned over the past 10 years with what we called our Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. So we had in place a plan from 2010 to 2020 that covered a whole range of different sustainability metrics. And we spent a lot of time and effort and energy on behavior change programs. So trying to encourage people to wash their hands five times a day, to clean their teeth tw twice a day. Lots of time and energy on trying to encourage consumers to adopt different ways of, of decarbonizing their own, their own lifestyles. And I think actually what we found is we can spend a lot of time and we will continue to do so on encouraging, for example, if you're using washing machine to wash at a lower temperature or if you're having a shower to, to think about low shower, uh, low, low volume shower heads and things like that. But actually, sometimes it's quite difficult for all of us to think, well, at an individual level, does it really make a difference if I do this one thing? So actually, instead, we looked at, well, if we really focused our efforts and energies on trying to come up with a green energy network, it's not going to matter so much exactly how long someone's using washing machine for. So I think that systems change part is really, really important. And so, for example, really pushing for green energy solutions makes a huge difference. And to do that, you need private sector and government and a multi-stakeholder approach. It isn't just something that either, either stakeholder can lead on their own. So you know, I think that's a really important part. And I think the other thing, we and we talked a little bit about it, was obviously already the shared vision and buy-in for the need uh, for everybody to, to, to come up with much more standardised methodologies and, and, and measurement. Um, so that, of course, requires as well a lot of pre-competitive collaboration. Um, so I think that's really important that, you know, that's put out there. This isn't about Unilever or anybody else gaining competitive advantage from this everybody needs to be involved and you know we need to be all in right the way across the ecosystem thank you and that issue of trust um dick and i'm just going to come to you to pick up on this and whether you see this this sense again of the, the companies leading and i guess trusting each other and obviously the world business council for sustainable development is a place for 26 years now that there's been one of these pre-collaborative uh, solution spaces but but how, you know how do you get companies together to kind of trust each other in this very important uh, piece of work well i do think actually the the role that you play claire at the wbcsd as a, a a platform that has history and provenance in setting protocols and standards is enormously important. Um, I mean, we, we see three or four things. I think one, we need a unified methodology for sharing primary emission data across the value chain players. Um, two, I think we need standardized met methodologies for verified calculation of the emissions in those, in those industries. Um, I think we need data exchange platforms um, and then there's a willingness to collaborate and exchange, including data security mechanisms, et cetera. And I, I think there's a concern here, and Rebecca, you alluded it, to, that, that um, there's a sense that uh, companies may be worried that by revealing this in some way, it allows customers or competitors to re-engineer their cost structures. Um, and they may be right. <laughs> um, so I, I think thinking through those collaborative mechanisms are super important. You know, the, the, another area that, that uh, RMI are, are, are leading, we're, we're happy to participate is things like the Mission Possible Partnership. These, you know, across the seven hard to abate se sectors, steel, cement, aluminum, uh, trucking, aviation, steel, petrochemicals, this kind of cross collaborative approach across supply chains um, but that getting, getting, I, I do think you need a platform such as yours um, where, where you can be a repository for that data that can be trusted and goes on. And if you can form that, then, then you've got the basis for, you know, carbon, carbon markets to scale, um, uh, yep. capital allocation, offset management, avoidance, whatever, all, all these things then become possible, but um, getting that together. And that's why we're so excited also about the, you know, the carbon transparency pathfinder work that, that you're, you're leading. So those are a few thoughts. Thank can you. I There's a great question it? from the audience. Yes, please, Jules. Uh, Dickon just mentioned something really important, right? In the end, we all know that markets will move when we start putting a price on attributes, and in this case, the carbon attribute of products. But in order to do that, you either can have 
governments and policymakers negotiate. And that's been tried now for about 15 years and hasn't gotten any far further. And Article 6 under the Paris Agreement, which intended to establish that, is still up for discussion. In the meantime, if we're successful with what we're talking about here, namely creating these open source standards and data uh, sets that allow us to assess the carbon attribute of every product and service, then we can start pricing carbon in a voluntary market setup. Exactly. And we're already starting to emerge, see that emerge. Uh, Dickin was referring to the work we're doing uh, in the Mission Possible Partnership, for example, under aviation, where companies are saying, we want to fly carbon neutral. We therefore have to understand precisely the carbon attribute associated with this flight, with this ticket, and then we'll secure a robust, uh, verifiable, certifiable offset that, that, that addresses that emission. Uh, so that's the beginning of the emergence of pricing carbon attributes. If Unilever starts to say for our next plant, the steel that we buy needs to be certified green steel made uh, in a low carbon fashion, uh, then that starts to put a value on that carbon attribute. That is, I think, the most powerful way in which we're going to drive uh, impact. So I think it's it's an important point you made, Dickin. Thank you, Jules. And just to amplify that, and, and thank you for bringing in the sort of, you know, the intergovernmental negotiation process, which has achieved many things, but is fiendishly difficult given the complexity and the, and the sort of the vested interest. And I think what what perhaps isn't always realised is that the voluntary efforts are in many ways pathfinders for what could come later in terms of compliance markets. They're solving problems. They're actually creating, as you say, carbon prices that are that are tangible and real time and based on real data rather than estimates. And, and that's essentially what we need for those markets to develop. There's a great question from the audience, um, which are, which is how many? Why are so many companies avoiding putting scope three emissions in their own net zero targets? Why, why are these being treated as optional? And perhaps, Rebecca, I could I could kick off again with you, because I know you have been quite forward-leaning in including Scope 3 emissions in, in Unilever's targets. But tell us why it's difficult. You know, I think, it, you know, if it... If it, if it was if it was easy we'd all we'd all be doing it already i know i think part of it is the lack of data which we've talked about and, and really being able to understand you know how, how do you decarbonize your, your value chains i think part of it is you know the scale of the work that needs to be done you know is 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 absolutely huge i think we talked about Pathfinder and some of the advantages. I mean, I think having the tech providers on board is really, really helpful and important because that's helping to standardize and improve access to data. I think there is, and we've talked about it a little bit already, you know, there, there is, I think, um, you know, some trepidation that some of this information is very commercially sensitive and, you know, how, how will that be used in, in, in other decision-making instances? Um, you know, again, we, we've very much taken the view, you know, we, we, we've got to do this, we, we, we've got to do it properly. That's why we set out the, the Climate Transition Action Plan. And, you know, we hope by doing that, we will start to see more and more others joining us. And, and, and indeed, and indeed they are. But I think there's a lot that we can do at an industry level as well to try and, and, and encourage others to, to, to get on board. I mean, when I look at the way that we approach sustainability at Unilever, it's always get your own house in order, work across your value chain, bring the work you're doing to life your brand so we've, we've launched a billion euro climate and nature fund to talk about this kind of work but in a very consumer friendly way so putting it front and center and then the last part of that is the influence that you can have on on, on wider society so for example what can we do through some of the groups like transform to net zero obviously wbcsd and the pathfinder project what can we do through uh, advocacy programs, working together with WEF, looking at how business can get behind COP26, you know, and come up with a much more unified approach. I think, you know, disclose climate policy positions. I think that's something really important. You know, disclosing principal trade associations that companies are part of, really making sure that everything that you're doing and or and the way that the company is oriented through those four stages, your own operations, your value chain, your brands, and what you're doing in wider society is all oriented around net zero. Um, but I think this, you know, that's why we are really such believers in things like Pathfinder, because I think what it's enabling us to do is to try and solve some of these problems at scale. And you know, there's no point if you just get the same Sort of more progressive companies involved you know you you need to get everybody on board and you know i'm much more of a believer in trying to help address some of these issues i appreciate as well for 
you know, some SMEs, it, 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 it's, it, it's, a, it's a minefield of where to start. It's not easy. It's really, really complicated. Um, so I think the more that there are these inter-industry collaborations and the more that we can extend things like the Pathfinder work to others, you know, for me, the better. Because if you don't do this at scale, it won't have the impact that, that we all need it to have. Thank you. And, and Dick, and the point that Rebecca just made about SMEs, because I'm sure there are people watching thinking, yeah, this is all really interesting, but, you know, I'm trying to make payroll and deal with reopening my business premises, and this is all great, but this is just really difficult. How do you kind of broaden this out so this becomes business as usual for, for all companies and all parts of the value chain? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a really tricky one. Um, and ultimately, it's, a bit, it's quite a, a network problem. Um, I think it may be some of the really big companies who realize um, that they have to go back into tier one, two, three, four, five, six of their supply chain. And that's where they will bump into uh, a lot of these SMEs. And I think they'll have to help them. Um, over over time, I think we will end up with, uh, and Rebecca, you mentioned the, the sort of tech players, you know, a, a lot of this stuff will end up in the, in the cloud um, and it will be, you know, part of some standard standard offerings but it could take three to five years um and i think that therefore the getting back to the the, the importance of things like the pathfinder are so important to, to try and find those areas to prove that it works across different industries um but it could also be you know we all know that collaboration is the key to so much of getting to net zero this could be a bit of a trojan horse for for collaboration because i think if people really realize that this becomes a source of competitive advantage um, I, in some ways, it must trigger greater collaboration if we can find the right platforms and trusted parties to, to work through. But, um, yeah, it's, yeah a, and, it's a tricky problem and, and just, getting the wrong way back. Just to pick up on that. But, yeah, I mean, because we talk about this, and, and when I, I, had my, I had to have my experts explain it to me. So the work we're basically doing is to define a reporting protocol, a bit like a sort of internet protocol for emissions. So there is one shared way of reporting in your particular own company scope one emissions. We're then creating essentially a shared data lake, which is secure because obviously there's lots of competitive information in there that can be managed effectively and is ideally a public good. I mean, what could go wrong? That sounds perfect. Why, why is this... Why is this difficult? Why can't we just solve for this very quickly? Dickon, you, you're part of this argument. Well, I, 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 think it, it, it's the level of trust to, to put that data in there. Although I think now I know a number of companies across many of the hard to abate sectors that are looking for places to own and house that data because the danger right now is that some companies will be managed at the aggregate level. And the financial community is ahead of the real economy, but they look at things at an aggregated level. And what's now important are natural endowments owned by, you know, it turns out the you know mining region A is is better or more fundamentally advantaged. And I think those folks that have those assets and begin to realize that they have them will want to disclose that at the asset level. Um, so uh, I, I think there will be a push to get it done. Um, but, um, you, you know, you've got to overcome those barriers of, of collaboration and trust, but you've got, got to find those first uh, beachheads to start, which I think is a little bit what, yeah. what you're trying to do. We're storming the beachheads. Jules, I'm going to come to you. We've got, we've got just over a minute left, but you, you started with something I wanted to try and finish on, which is this sort of global imperative. You know, we're at four and a half million year, year highs for CO2. We're seeing these effects. It feels like we're running out of time, and it feels like there are some who would rather us sit around and debate perfect rather than get on with good you know with this very business focus group and audience what how would you kind of you know get people to realize that this is not optional this is this is what we what we all have to do what's the, the it's the imperative yeah i don't think you can run a business today and not be fully informed about the signs of climate change because if you understand the science you then have to come to grips with both the physical asset risk and the transition risk that your business is facing. And those risks at this point are truly daunting. You only have to look what is happening around the world every day, in day, in day out, to come to grips with those risks. And McKinsey has written a big report around this. It's, it's, it's staring us in the face. So this is no longer a story of, of naive optimism that says, yeah, we'll fix this. That's no problem. Of course, we have plenty of time. No, we are truly facing a planetary emergency. And if you master a bit of the science, you will quickly come to understand that. Now, 
we all learn to manage risk. So if we have come to grips with the risks, then we know what to do about it. And that's where the hope emerges, because then the private sector can actually get their act together. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I saw a video on the internet of Peter Terkova, one of uh, your colleagues, uh, talking about how Unilever is going to take fossil fuel feedstocks out of their home care products. Very exciting. Uh, it is a company that is realizing that it has a responsibility and a risk and that it can move fast enough and do something that were unimaginable five, 10 years ago. So when we unleash that innovation and that creativity and that drive in businesses, we still have a chance. We've got to get our act together.